Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You remember the old children's parable. It has a nice ring to it, but it's not really accurate, is it? Uh, words can actually be quite hurtful. Uh, I know I've been hurt by them. Is, is that, can you hear me? Is there a, okay, I can hear some echo, I'm sorry. Um, I know I've been hurt by words, and in fact, there was a moment here on this campus uh, when I was very much hurt by words. Fifteen years ago, I was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed freshman here at Yale University when a group of students invited the late Amiri Baraka to come speak at Yale. Now, Baraka was a famous playwright, but he had become rather notorious in his later years because he had written a poem about 9-11 entitled, Somebody Blew Up America, in which he claimed that the Prime Minister of Israel had somehow told 4,000 Israelis in New York not to show up for work that day at the Twin Towers. Now, this uh, accusation that the Jewish state somehow had some sort of foreknowledge about the worst terrorist attack on American soil and had furthermore withheld that information from the world in order to provoke some sort of civilizational war in the Middle East was a pretty clear-cut case of conspiratorial anti-Semitism. Now, naturally, many people were upset by the decision to host Baraka here at Yale, not least the Jewish community. And as a 19-year-old uh, Jewish freshman from the suburbs of Boston, whose only real experience of anti-Semitism had maybe been some teasing in, in elementary school for not celebrating Christmas, I wasn't really prepared to deal with a moment like this, with someone like this being invited to campus. Now, in retrospect, reflecting on how often campus uh, speakers on, at colleges and universities are protested by students or their talks are completely shut down, I could have stood up in the middle of this event and started screaming that Baraka was a hater and an anti-Semite and that he was invading my safe space. I could have gotten in front of the dean who invited him and screamed at her and said that you know, she should resign and lose her job. But what I did instead was, as a budding columnist for the Yale Daily News, I went to the event and I sat in the back of the room and I respectfully took notes on what he had to say. And when Baraka made his claim that Israel somehow knew about 9-11 and didn't tell anyone, uh, I got up and asked him if he had any sources for this information. He looked at me and said I had constipation of the face and required a brain enema, which was a little hurtful, uh, particularly when all the students in the room laughed at me and gave him a standing ovation afterwards. I went home, back to my dorm, and I wrote a column for the Yale Daily News. And I said that this was one of the most disturbing events in my life. Now, I look back on this uh, event because it played a major role in my maturation from a teenager into an adult. In my experience at Yale of confronting very difficult ideas and vexing personal situations, has informed the way that I look at the debates that are raging across this country and indeed the world about freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is the most important right that we have as citizens in a liberal society. It is the freedom, the right upon which all other freedoms are contingent. And we are incredibly lucky to live in a country where we have something called the First Amendment. The founders understood how important free speech was to maintaining a liberal, free, and democratic society, that they enshrined it as the First Amendment in our Constitution. And it's actually quite rare to live in a society that protects freedom of speech so strongly as the United States. Uh, according to Freedom House, which is a global human rights monitor, only 13% of the world's population live in countries that protect freedom of speech. Now, I'm often asked, as a Jewish person and a gay man, how can you support the right of bigots and homophobes and anti-Semites to spew their hatred and their bigotry? To which I respond, it is precisely because I'm these things that I think we have to defend the rights of everyone equally to be able to have free speech. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people in my generation, I'm, a, I'm a, on the later side of the millennial scale, a lot of people in my millennial generation don't really seem to understand this concept or don't agree with it. 
according to a recent uh, poll commissioned by the Pew Research Center, 40% of millennials believe that the government should be able to ban statements that are offensive to minority groups. And it's not just millennials. On the other side of the political spectrum, goaded by a president who attacks the news outlets that he doesn't like as fake news and who threatens to use the libel laws to bankrupt publications that are critical about him, 45%, 45% of Republicans today believe that the government should have the right to shut down media outlets that are inaccurate or biased. A problem uh, that we see, uh, what I really actually want to talk about today, though, is the issue of free speech on campus, because it's there where the future generations are being taught. And it's there where, frankly, it seems not a day goes by that there isn't some sort of controversy erupting about freedom of speech, of uh, campus speakers being shouted down, of commencement speakers being disinvited. And a crucial concept that seems to be embraced by uh, many people today is that words equal violence. Well, words are not sticks and stones. They may cause you distress, as they certainly have me in the past, and frankly, every day I hear words that cause me distress, but they're not gonna break your bones. And what's rather ironic about this is that often the people who make this claim that words equal violence are the ones who actually use real violence to shut down the speech of people with whom they disagree. Last year, the University of California at Berkeley had to spend $600,000 on security to protect a speaker coming to campus from a rampaging mob. Now, Yale, unfortunately, has not been immune to this intellectual discourse of censorship. A couple days before Halloween in 2015, the Yale Intercultural Affairs Council sent an email to the entire undergraduate student body in which it asked students not to wear costumes that, quote, threaten our sense of community through the process of cultural appropriation. It then sent a helpful list of costumes to avoid, such as this one. Now, reading this email, you would have thought that Yale was awash with students just running around in racist, offensive Halloween costumes. But it actually wasn't. And the problem with this email is that it really assumed the worst of Yale students. It assumed that they were just waiting for this you know, pagan bacchanalia holiday to dress up in blackface or, or giant tacos. Now, feeling understandably somewhat patronized by this email, many students wrote to Nicola and Erica Christakis, the master and associate master, respectively, of Silliman College. And Erica wrote uh, an email back to her students, to the Silliman community, and she said, I wonder if we should reflect more transparently as a community on the consequences of an institution, which is to say bureaucratic and administrative, exercise of implied control over college students. Have we lost faith in young people's capacity, in your capacity, to exercise self-censure through social norming and also in your capacity to ignore or reject things that trouble you? Seems perfectly reasonable to me. If you're walking down the street and you see someone wearing a costume that you don't like, you can go up to them and perhaps explain to them why you find their costume offensive. Or you can just look the other way. Well, that's when all hell broke loose. 700 students, faculty, and alumni signed an open letter denouncing Nicola and Erica Christakis. The following day, a group of students confronted Nicholas in the quad of Silliman College where they berated him over the course of several hours, screaming in his face, demanding that he apologize for the thought crimes of his wife. And then later, a group of students presented a list of demands to the president of Yale College, insisting that Nicola and Erica be fired. A common thread in these arguments in favor of censorship is that censorship helps the victims of discrimination. In 2015, a group of terrorists burst into the Paris office of Charlie Hebdo, 
a satirical newspaper, which had published a handful of cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad in the past. And they killed half the staff. Shortly afterwards, Gary Trudeau, who's one of the most famous American cartoonists, and a Yale grad, by the way, he was accepting a Lifetime Achievement Award, and he gave a speech about Charlie Hebdo. And surprisingly, he didn't stand with his murdered colleagues. He actually made excuses for the people who killed them. By punching downward, by attacking a powerless, disenfranchised minority with crude, vulgar drawings closer to graffiti than cartoons, Charlie wandered into the realm of hate speech, Gary Trudeau said. Those of us who defend the right of a newspaper to mock a religion, he said, had surrendered to our own kind of fanaticism. So in Gary Trudeau's logic, it was the men who burst into a newspaper office and killed 11 people because of cartoons they didn't like. Those people were apparently powerless. And it was the people who were murdered for drawing those cartoons who were the fanatics. And I have to say, if the men and women who were murdered by terrorists for drawing cartoons were alive to hear this excuse for their murder, they would probably be surprised that it was they and not the men who killed them who were being accused of punching downwards. Now, perhaps you um, recognize this man over here, Fred Phelps. He used to lead a, a church called the Westboro Baptist Church. And he would stand outside the funerals of gay men who died of AIDS with these lovely signs. In 2014, uh, before he died in 2014, the British government banned Fred Phelps from stepping foot on its territory because they were accusing him of hate speech. Now, I'm obviously very offended by what Fred Phelps had to say about gays, about Jews, pretty much about everything. And I'm sure most of us are as well. He's a, he was a pretty offensive guy. That's kind of what he specialized in. But I can't think of a worse way to combat the real evil bigotry of a man like Fred Phelps than by banning him from saying what he wants to say. And in fact, doing so betrays a fundamental precept of the very movement that has won equality for LGBT people in this country, which is that living in a free society, you should be able to have the right to say, to love who you want, as long as that does not impinge upon the freedom of other people. And that's because freedom is an expansive concept. It includes not just the right to marry someone of the same gender, but also to say and write your ideas. And sometimes those ideas are going to be offensive to people. But you don't have a right to not be offended. The problem with censorship is that once you accept a little bit of it, it's very, very difficult to prevent a lot. Let's take the example of Russia, where five years ago, the government there passed a law banning the propaganda promoting uh, non-traditional sexual relationships to minors. Now, this law basically makes it illegal to say anything remotely positive about gay people or same-sex relationships. And shortly after this law was passed, a 24-year-old man was arrested simply for holding up a sign that said, support the gays and lesbians of Russia down with the fascists and homophobes. Now, clearly, while the, one of the reasons this law was passed was to distract the Russian people from their problems and to target a vulnerable minority, but there was really a deeper, ulterior motive behind this law. This law, if you read about it, is always mentioned in the media as being an anti-gay or, or a homophobic law. But if you actually read the text of the law itself, the words gay or homosexual don't appear once in the text. So ultimately, what this law is really about, it's about prohibiting a certain type of speech. And it affects everyone in Russia, not just the gay people, but straight people as well. And the reason that the Russian government did this 
And the reason why it should concern those of us who believe in freedom is that if the Russian government can ban certain types of positive references about homosexuality today, what's to stop it from banning negative comments and negative speech about Vladimir Putin or the Russian government tomorrow? Because it's this, ultimately, what frightens Vladimir Putin most. It's not gay people. It's not the moral degradation of Russian society. If he really cared about the moral degradation of Russian society, surely he'd be doing something to combat the rampant alcoholism, the unwanted pregnancies, the transmission of uh, sexually transmitted diseases. He'd be doing all sorts of things to combat those problems, but he's not. Because he knows that a society where people are able to speak freely, free of the Soviet-era fear that what they say could land them in jail or fined, a society where people are able to speak freely is a society where his power is challenged. And so what does he do? He chips away bit by bit, little by little, on the freedom of the Russian people to speak their minds and have a debate and have a conversation. Freedom of speech um, was ultimately the tool that all civil rights movements in America used to gain their equality. From the African American civil rights movement to the women's movement to the gay rights movement. It wasn't so long ago that gay people couldn't even meet in a bar without worrying that the police might just randomly show up, assault the patrons, and cart them off to jail. Gay publications were confiscated in the US mail, and their publishers were brought to court for uh, transmitting obscenity. So gay rights pioneers, to fight this, what did they do? They organized, they marched, they wrote newspaper articles, they used the First Amendment, they used their freedom of speech. This is a photo taken in 1965 of the first gay rights protest in the United States. And it took place across the street from the White House. 1965, imagine how incredibly brave those men and women were. They were almost universally seen by American society as being sick and depraved. But what changed over the next 50 years? They used their freedom of speech to convince people that they were right and that they weren't subhuman, that they were just like other people. A couple of years ago, a pair of gay businessmen, they hosted a, a fireside chat with Texas Senator Ted Cruz, who's a pretty vocal opponent of gay marriage. When news of this meeting went public, there were calls for massive protests of the two gay businessmen, of their businesses. People on Facebook called them cockroaches and compared them to Nazi collaborators simply because they had a meeting with Ted Cruz. Ultimately, they apologized because they were fearful that their businesses would take a hit. And what was so discouraging about this was that a group of gay people were attacking another group of gay people simply for having a conversation. It's as if they forgot the entire history of the gay rights movement, which was based upon convincing people who disagreed to change their minds. Gay people ultimately won the argument because they decided to have one. It was people like Frank Kameny, who in 1957 was, a, was fired from his job in the Army Map Service because he was gay. And what did he do? 16 years later, he successfully campaigned to get the American Psychiatric Association to remove homosexuality from its list of mental disorders. Now, Kameny had very little power compared to an established institution like the American Psychiatric Association. And he won his battle, not by limiting the free speech rights of those with whom he disagreed, but by fully embracing his own. Freedom of speech is the lifeblood of democracy. And being able to argue with people respectfully, even if they have awful, hateful, repulsive ideas, is what distinguishes us from the dictatorships and the tribal societies where differences are settled by the sword, if they're even settled at all. The best antidote to hateful, stupid, and offensive speech is intelligent, persuasive, and nuanced speech. And that's as true for gay rights in Russia 
as it is for Halloween costumes here at Yale. Thank you very much. Thank you.